Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap of the Week. In this one, we'll be talking about ASRock's X670E Tai Chi motherboard detailed more fully now and photographed. We'll also be going over some of the rumors and news alike from the past week or so, including RTX 40 series, additional rumors, some leaks from MSI with the power supply targeted at dealing with GPU transient spikes. That's interesting timing. Anyway, this aligns with the video that we just posted about power supply transients being potentially a huge issue with the 40 series. So that'll be an interesting product launch. Uh, leaked Z790 and H770 motherboards also in the news. These mostly interesting because of the continued DDR4 support, at least if the leaks are true. And then some news from AMD, like FSR 2.0 source code being released, which enables people like game modders to start adding it in to games that are open enough to integrate it. So let's get started with the news. Before that, this video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is a Linux server hosting provider that GN has used for nearly a decade now for its own servers. Alongside dedicated website hosting, Linode makes it easy to cut out third-party VPN services to build your own VPN that you fully control, easily configured via the interface. Linode also has hundreds of guides for custom servers, including game server apps like Rust, Minecraft, CSGO, and guides to host your own video calling servers to eliminate third parties. Linode is a great way to take back control of software and your hosting, and Gamers Nexus viewers get a $100 credit for 60 days on new accounts at linode.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below. First up, and very quickly, we started streaming again. So on the GN side of things, we've been really excited to finally get back into streaming. It, I don't know, we used to stream almost every month consistently for about a year or two. And then over the last year that died down, a lot of that was because of technical issues with the streaming system. Finally, I had time to go through it. We've now done two live streams, one two hours long, one almost three hours long, like a PC build and uh, sorting through a bag of random CPUs. So really excited to have those back. We're targeting doing those once per week now. So make sure you tune in. It'll typically be towards the end of the week, but it's not scheduled firmly. And we'll also be reintroducing some live overclocking streams with liquid nitrogen, hopefully bringing out just the Ponzi from Bearded Hardware from some of that. So anyway, really looking forward to that. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. If you haven't caught one of the live streams, you should tune in and check it out because we always, it, it's, because of the audience interaction, we always get some really good technical questions so we can sort of talk some detail to common questions people have that we might not think to address in a video otherwise. And then you also get some good entertainment working on things like really weird cases from AliExpress, like the tank-shaped PC case that Patrick and I just built in last week. So check out the streams when you see them. Uh, we will always tweet about those in, a little bit in advance, but otherwise you just got to catch them when you catch them because we don't schedule them. They're a spur of the moment, and that's what makes them more fun. So first news item is ASRock X670E Tai Chi. This is a board in the upcoming Zen 4 family of products. So as a reminder, again, x 670 E is not a different chipset than X670. They are both the same chipset. It's just that the E has certain guarantees for graphics compatibility, and you'll see that in this board and uh, regarding PCIe generation, that is, and the lanes assigned to each slot. So short of the ASRock Aqua board, this is generally one of the flagships. In the photos on the website, ASRock shows a blacked out design with bronze accents, making such bold statements as, philosophy of infinite potential. We're assuming they're referring to the infinite potential of being blacklisted by ASRock for giving one of their motherboards a critical review. Even though you've reviewed many of their products positively or neutrally, the critical one is bad and unwanted, and therefore you can no longer test our products. The board has two 8-pin EPS 12-volt connectors, but remains on ATX 12 volts rather than moving to 12VO. That's expected for now, at least. For fans, we're counting at least eight 4-pin headers, what looks to be eight SATA connectors as well, and then the standard assortment of I.O. support. Accessories that we can see, at least, include a power and a reset button. There's a visible seven-segment display, two PCIe slots, and a partially accessible CMOS battery. Unfortunately, it looks like you're going to have to take off the bottom aesthetics-only armor plate. It doesn't cover an M.2 SSD that we can see uh, in order to pull the CMOS battery. As for the socket, it's massive. We'll be curious to see how this tests in our pressure benchmarks. And if you haven't seen it, actually, our testing with the Thermal Grizzly contact frame, that was really fun and interesting, pretty insightful for the Intel socket. AMD's upcoming socket is similarly large, if not maybe a little bit larger for AM5, and will pose a great opportunity to do some other testing like that. By the way, after all the interest in that Thermal Grizzly contact frame coverage, uh, which if you didn't see, you should go check it out. It's 
really fun as a video, pretty informative, and maybe you'll find a, a new project to do on your computer. But this is the frame. There was so much interest in this small thing that we bought three other ones. The cheapest one that we found was about $9. And so we're going to test those against this $35 option and see how they all do. Anyway, different story. So ASRock for this board, it states that the PCIe slots, they will have one PCIe Gen 5 by 16. That's the top slot. That would be your video card. And then one PCIe Gen 5 by 8. So if you're doing dual GPU for competitive overclocking or something, you've got both of those options there. And uh, X670E boards will have these in general. That's one of the requirements. The company claims a 26-phase uh, what it says, SPS DR MOS power design. It talks about its Blazit trademark M.2 slots, which are naturally, of course, obviously faster than the Hyper M.2 slots. And then they also have the Lightning Gaming ports. So, all of this marketing aside, what that actually means is that the uh, Blazing, as the, uh, the name goes, M.2 slots are PCIe Gen 5 by 4 and then the Hyper M.2 slots are PCIe Gen 4 by 4 Yes, that is, that is correct. So that's the difference. Uh, there's two of those on this board. And then Lightning USB ports for gaming, they're just normal USB ports that you plug your mouse and keyboard into. Isn't marketing fun? Now the next news piece relates directly to the GPU Power Spikes transient video we did. And that one was so much fun to work on. I can't wait to do more of them like that. We've really been killing it with the technical content and having that creative spin to it lately. Uh, so huge, huge ups to the team for that. Um, this one, so the power supply is a leak right now, but it looks to be legitimate. There's no reason anyone would really make a, a fake power supply leak. It's kind of a boring component to fake. You should definitely check out the transient piece for background here. But this power supply talks about GPU transients uh, being one of its main targets for countering. In our piece we did, talking about the 30 series, we talked about upwards of two times transient spikes. And for the 40 series, the rumors are anywhere from two to three times transient spikes. If that's the case, you could be looking at something like 400 watts suddenly becoming 1,200 watts plus of transient load that's placed on the power supply and the power supply needs to be able to stay online. So leaker Golden Mango on Twitter posted slides of MSI's ultimate future-proof power supply, as they dub it. Most of the marketing is unremarkable. However, the most notable aspect is the claim that MSI's power supply can handle GPU power, it says excursions, or basically transient spikes, that go up to 3x. Now to be clear, we don't know what their baseline is, so 3x against 200 watts is a lot less impressive than 3x against 400, 450 watts. And the baseline does matter when you're talking about a multiplier, but uh, we're assuming they're probably talking about the higher end. Now, this can also be a dangerous game to play if they're really just raising the OPP limits, but more likely this is just more advanced and expensive as a design, or hopefully it is. MSI states that the AI 1300P and AI 1000P power supplies have a, a PCIe Gen 5 12-pin header port and that's another mark in that future-proof branded direction. Because this is MSI, however, they can't go to marketing slides without saying something about gamers and leveling up. The company highlights its 12VH power header and notes 600 watts capacity, says that it's leveling up, and uh, this is also just the PCIe Gen 5 spec, so it's not that special, but these are still uncommon, and that's what makes it noteworthy. MSI says the power supply is intelligent, which no doubt means that it's going to be hooked up to MSI's bloatware, so that's very unfortunate. Uh, this can be useful because you can get things like power consumption readout through software, which means potentially logging, potentially more accurate reads on what's getting pulled through the PCIe versus the EPS 12 volt connectors. However, in the past, when I've worked with the uh, smart digital power supplies, the biggest issue we've run into has been when they lose the settings that you set on AC loss. So depending on if they're writing these settings to firmware or to some flash on the power supply, one of the more annoying things is when you switch from multi-rail to single rail because you need to deal with those larger spikes uh, or higher loads in general. So you're trying to reduce the OCP uh, trip potential by increasing OCP basically. The issue is once you eventually do have to reset the power or pull the plug and do a hard disconnect on the AC supply, and suddenly your settings are all reset. And if it's the, the AX1600i we've worked with, 
then when the software is no longer supported, it becomes a huge pain in the ass to find it online because you have to go dig up some legacy dead unupdated software and then apply the settings again. So hopefully MSI doesn't go that direction. Up next is a quick one. This is Phoenix PC. So this is a new system integrator company that has risen from the ashes of Artesian builds. You may remember the coverage with CEO Noah Katz doing the giveaway, not giveaway, and eventually running the company into the ground. There's the re-roll. Sponsored by Intel. Thanks, Intel. Well, now the employees who remain, at least from the East Coast branch of the office, uh, some of them have banded together to make their new company Phoenix PC. Phoenix PC has a couple of pre-built pre-configured on its website. These are dubbed the Harpy, Siren, and Griffin. Now, there are a lot of system integrator companies out there, so if you're asking what Phoenix does that no one else is doing right now, from what we can tell, it seems to be that all of the pre-built options include the letter Y. Anyway, from a small company perspective, this makes a lot of sense to basically have three pre-configured options sort of in the same camp as the IWI Power Ready or RDY systems, where it just makes it easier to skew up and not carry this million dollar inventory to build every custom option that someone wants. So uh, we're not opposed to that. It makes a lot of sense for a startup that doesn't have as much capital, has fewer people, and really needs to focus on getting a quality product out the door first before it starts trying to do these fully custom orders. So we haven't bought from them. Um, just some perspective here, uh, because I know people are going to request that we do a review of a pre-built from Phoenix. So I was talking with the team about this actually a long time ago, and we stay away from system integrators of a certain small size because I view it sort of like the prime directive from Star Trek, where it's like uh, when, you know, when it's IWI power, when it's Dell, when it's CyberPower, we can influence them a little bit, but we're not going to put them out of business, and we're also not going to make them suddenly profitable if they weren't otherwise. And when it's a small company that's either run by one person, we see a lot of those where they request that we review their own product, or run by a small team and it's an upstart. Honestly, just speaking frankly, we're at a size now uh, where, and hopefully this, this comes across the right way, but where we have a little too much influence over the success or failure of a small company. And I think that companies like Phoenix PC here, honestly, it's just better if they get their start with you all trying them out, if you genuinely want to try them out, and then we'll worry about reviewing it once they're more established, because it's really, it's just not fair at some level to uh, potentially boost a company so much when it's a small that it can't, it's just not logistically set up to deal with the order influx we would create. That could cause a massive amount of headaches for them. Even though a lot of orders is a good problem, it can also be a very bad problem if not handled properly, if they're not set up for it. On the other side, if we end up getting a system that's bad, then you potentially just put the company out of business when it didn't even get a chance to start. That's not really fair either, because at least with Iowa Power, Cyber Power, Dell, Main Gear, Origin, they're all big boys. They've been doing it a long time, and they can take a few hits and hopefully improve. But yeah, at a certain size, it's just it's too much too much influence at the uh, in the position we're in now. So anyway, uh, very interested in Phoenix PCs, but I'm going to allow them to get more established before we do any of the secret shopper type reviews. So um, that said, if you all buy from them, we'd be very curious to hear what your experience is because uh, right now the consumer reviews matter more honestly than a reviewer review would for this upstart. All right, up next, AMD's FSR 2.0 source code has been officially released. It's been about a year now since AMD's spatial upscaler Fidelity FX Super Resolution 1.0 released, and AMD has now released the source code for its temporal upscaler FSR 2.0. This is different from Radeon Super Resolution, as a reminder, which we reviewed separately. And there are currently 24 games that are supported on FSR 2.0, and that is now growing faster because it's not just open to the developers who integrate it, but also open to everybody. Uh, so to sort of speak to this, there's already a modder named, uh, <laughs> I checked the name, and it didn't disappoint me. Potato of Doom 1337, so we got some, some elite names in the house, has already unofficially incorporated FSR into Cyberpunk 2077, and this is as a replacement or an alternative to NVIDIA's earlier implemented DLSS in Cyberpunk. FSR 1.0 and 2.0 can both be exposed at the same time, and uh, the technologies are different, so they're both available. Deathloop has both available, for example, and uh, that's directly an AMD partnered title with FSR 2.0 as well. Now, the source code and the documentation are available via AMD's GPU Open website, and they are also available under the MIT license on a dedicated page. 
And so any implementations you want to do under that license, you are free to do. Avatar 2.0 supports DX12. It supports Vulkan. It supports the Xbox development kit if you're not banned like we are. And uh, it also has plugins available for Unreal Engine 4.26, 4.27, and Unreal Engine 5. Up next, just a quick one for the keyboard enthusiasts out there. So Cherry has a new MX Ultra Low Profile Switch. This is a new addition to its Ultra Low Profile line that it introduced last year. And it's from Cherry AG, which is of course one of the, is probably the most prominent switch manufacturer in everything, but especially in keyboards. So this new switch is the Ultra Low Profile Tactile Switch. It is joining the previously introduced Click and a different switch that's an audible click type switch. And the ultra low profile line features stainless steel and plastic construction with optional RGB lighting. The ULP is Cherry's shallowest switch from the overall height of 3.5 millimeters with 1.8 millimeters of travel and an actuation point of 0.8 millimeters. The new tactile version has no click, just a tactile bump felt in the switch travel. It's clear that Cherry is trying to emulate the brown standard switch but in an extremely compact package here. These ULP switches, they're surface mount devices and they're intended to be soldered directly to the PCB. They are targeted to be used in laptop keyboards and low profile desktop keyboards to enable true mechanical operation in the form factor a laptop would use. We, we don't do much keyboard coverage really, but again, Curious to hear what the audience thinks. Here's your engagement challenge. If you are into keyboards, you're a keyboard enthusiast, go ahead and we'll, we'll put the engagement challenge here, but go ahead and post a comment and let us know if this is something you care about, if you're interested in or not, because for us, where we don't specialize in keyboards, it actually does help a lot to see what sort of the experts in the audience think of this stuff so we know whether or not it's, it's one worth covering in the future and two, whether the company is, um, marketing it in a responsible way or not. So let us know what you think. All right, leaked Z790 and H770 boards up next. This is something that we do specialize in, is uh, motherboards for upcoming CPUs. So this one, honestly, it looks like a leak. Anyone could have just whipped together in Notepad, uh, but the list is consistent with what we would expect, and it's another sort of ASRock story. Included are models in the existing Tai Chi, the Pro, the Phantom Gaming, and the Steel Legend lines. Not mentioned, though, are the Extremer Aqua models. Maybe the ASRock leaker is trying to avoid being blacklisted from leaks in the future. If the leak is true, it confirms that DDR4 support is maintained on Raptor Lake as long as the motherboard is built for it. Now, this is a good move because DDR5 remains extremely expensive, somewhat difficult to get, and with the prices, DDR4 is just a lot. I mean, we don't know how much you'll lose on Raptor Lake in terms of performance with DDR4 versus 5. Certainly some of it at the high end uh, as DDR5 matures, but if it remains unobtainable due to price, then supporting DDR4 continuously is obviously a good thing. So uh, there's plenty of DDR4 out there if you did want to buy one of these. In the list of leaked boards, there's also a micro ATX form factor board. One of our team members is interested in this, assuming the ASRock versions of them are actually worth considering. This is just a fun story because it's an absolutely insane looking computer case. So this comes from Japanese designer Nagao Seisakusho. Hopefully got that good enough. If not, blame Twitter because I asked them how to pronounce that. Uh, he has enabled users to create massive DIY all-in-one PCs with an open air chassis. This is done by way of a new monitor mounting accessory that attaches to one of the existing large open air PC frames. The accessory is called the N-Frame OP01 and it features 75 millimeter or 100 millimeter VESA mounting holes. It attaches to one of the company's existing N-Frame cases available for motherboards of all major or standard form factors, EATX down to ITX. However, it is not compatible with the SFX power supply version of the ITX frame. Various other accessories like radiator mounts and vertical graphics card mounts are available to expand the feature set. Downsides of using the new monitor mount include not being able to see your components, the power button being on the wrong side, and fans being very close to the user with no panels to stop any of the noise. But if you need either heating or cooling and your AC is broken or your heating is broken, you can just point the fans at yourself. Regardless of those downsides, we like seeing products like this just because they're interesting and kind of fun. So I'm not sure that... We have a line to get one of these into review. We'll see if 
Maybe we can buy one and do one of the live stream builds with it on the live stream table over here to my right that we've been using lately. So uh, we'll try and get one of those in if you're interested in seeing it. Looks insane though, kind of fun. All right, Serpent Canyon up next. The next Intel enthusiast knock is coming and a user on the Chinese Baidu forums posted what looked like promotional images for the new product and outlined some product details. The user reports that Serpent Canyon Nux will come with an i7-12700H, which has 6P cores and 8E cores, as well as the upcoming Intel Arc A770M Alchemist GPU. Now, in theory, these hardware choices should bump the overall performance of this NUC over the previous Phantom Canyon NUCs. Phantom Canyon featured the i7-1165G7 quad-core CPU and NVIDIA's RTX 2060. We actually looked at these previously. Now, the chassis for Serpent Canyon is not as intimidatingly large as Beast Canyon or Dragon Canyon before it or after it. So the, the names are way better, at least, than the, the lakes that we normally talk about. But it's not as big as those. It's more similar to Hades Canyon, except upscaled a little bit. And there's some notes in the leak about having grills and ventilation punched around the chassis. Up next, NVIDIA RTX 40 series rumors. This comes from Copite 7 Kimi back again with more alleged details on the 40 series coming up on Twitter. So this one, there's specs, <laughs> allegedly, from the 4090, 4080, and 4070. The post suggests an RTX 4090 die named the AD102-300, AD meaning uh, Ada Lovelace, so that's the GPU architecture code name, and it claims 16,384 CUDA cores with 24 gigabytes of 21 gigabit per second GDDR6X memory. That's the most notable part. That's on a 384-bit memory bus, and as far as the CUDA core count, we're going to go through the other ones here, but just remember that CUDA cores generationally are not a linear one-to-one -one comparison. So if you have 30% more CUDA cores, first of all, it doesn't just mean 30% more performance, and it certainly doesn't mean just 30% more sort of CUDA to CUDA power because the cores change architecturally each generation, where sometimes you'll have a boost in the efficiency per watt or changes in the actual structure uh, of the rest of the SM. So anyway, something to be aware of. RTX 4080s will allegedly have the 8103-300. They are claimed to have 10,240 CUDA cores and 16 gigabytes of G6, although Copy isn't sure about the 4080s memory specifically. That is claimed to be on a 256-bit bus. And then for the last leak outline, it's the 4070 on AD104-275. So an interesting nomenclature there, and that one claims uh, 7168 CUDA cores with a memory capacity of 10 gigabytes of G6 on a 160-bit bus. So the memory may be being the weaker link here for this one. If these are true numbers, the core counts are higher than the 30 series equivalents. That's not really something that can be properly compared across generation, but also not that surprising. Recently, GPU prices are starting to come down, but Copite says not to expect a lower MSRP as compared to the 30 series. Combine 7 Kimi also notes total board power, claiming TBPs of 450 watts for the 4090, 420 watts for the 4080, and uh, again, being unsure on the 4080 detail for that one, and 300 watts for the 4070. TBPs are over 400 watts with, if you have transient spikes of 2 to 3x, that's where you get into that territory of why we made the video we made. Because suddenly, you know, transient spikes have always been around in PC parts and uh, in everything, but in the 1080 Ti's, when you're talking 200 watts going up to, let's say, 500 or 400, more realistically, that's a big spike, yes, but most power supplies can soak that because 200 to 400 is not a big deal. 400 to 800 or 400 to 1300, that's a problem. So that's where that story came from. Now, uh, manufacturers will be dealing with this for for the foreseeable future with upcoming cards from both AMD and NVIDIA. But again, these are just technically rumors for now, although that particular rumor about the power has been swirling the rumor toilet for a while now, and manufacturers have told us directly they've been informed by NVIDIA to prepare for it. Okay, up next is quickly, PCIe 7.0 has been announced. So uh, before anyone gets too cynical about this, just remember that the protocol or interface development always paces ahead of the actual product launches using that protocol or interface for by at least a year or two, if not more, because they need to ratify the spec before people start designing for it. So um, the PCIe Gen 5 devices are only just starting to show up, of course. PCI SIG has noted at its uh, PCI SIG developer conference that it's working on Gen 7. The new version will deliver 128 gigatransfers per second raw bit rate, or 512 gigabytes per second bi-directionally over a bi-16 slot. That means 32 gigabytes per second per individual lane. 
It's a lot. This is a doubling over the PCIe Gen 6, which is also not really out, and a quadrupling over the actually existing PCIe Gen 5. One technique PCI SIG cites as important for PCI Gen 7 is signaling via pulse amplitude modulation with four levels for PAM4. PAM4 is also used in PCIe Gen 6 with special error correction techniques called forward error correction and cyclic redundancy checks. As for PCIe Gen 7, the group cites one potential application being an 800 gigabit Ethernet, which is somewhat difficult to even conceptualize. There's plenty of time to consider the implications, however, as PCI SIG is looking to release this spec in 2025. And for perspective, it took just over four years for consumer devices to actually launch with PCIe Gen 5 after the announcement of the PCIe Gen 5 spec. Our last story for the week is just sort of a fun throwback. So Sean Donahue of My Retro Computer has completed a successful Kickstarter campaign to bring back the Commodore 64 as a DIY PC case with two pre-built models available. We might try and get one of these. We didn't know about the Kickstarter campaign when it was going on, uh, so we'll have to try and scrounge one up separately later. But the updated case is constructed of ABS plastic. It has Cherry MX switches and it has SA double shot keycaps for the keyboard, cutouts for a very small fan, a standard IO shield and a slim optical driver present, and internal mounting supports for either a standard ITX board or Raspberry Pi are present. There are a few versions of this. The ultimate version comes with a GTX 1650, Intel 9th Gen i5 CPU, kind of old there, eight gigabytes of SODIMM memory, and a 512 gigabyte NVMe M.2 drive. As for why the i5 9th gen CP, part of that, well, part of it's probably cost, and then part of it is probably also just thermals, where uh, this thing looks like it is going to be running extremely hot because the cooling is pretty limited on it. So keep expectations in check. It's, it's, it's a gimmick, not necessarily a bad thing, but it's for the look of the Commodore 64. It's not for the functionality of cooling from what we're seeing so far, although it does need to be, meet a baseline minimum. So this is expected to sell for $170 retail and fully available for the uh, DIY case version of it. That's it for Hardware News this week. Thanks for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. Check out the live stream later this week and go to patreon.com slash gamersnaccess where we just posted a brand new behind the scenes video. It's also a fantastic way to support us and our in-depth research pieces on things like the Thermal Grizzly contact frame or our Power Supply Transient piece. Of course, you can also go to store.gamersnaccess.net and grab mouse mats, mod mats, toolkits, and more. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.